Okay, welcome to CBOR Interim. Um, this is an ITF meeting, the note well applies. If you have any question, please contact your chair, me or Jim. Um, okay, today we have, sorry for the lateness of the agenda, but it came kind of at the last second. So I posted the link, let me repost the link to the minutes. Uh, on the agenda today, we have several items. Oh, I see that, uh, Jim, I guess you have added this item, which is a status of the Cibor BIS document from Barry, but I don't see Barry in the meeting. So I don't know, I guess, yeah, I don't think anybody has update on that. Yeah, that's fine. If, if he was here, it'd be nice to know when he's finally yeah, getting to it. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I guess we'll uh, let's try to contact him and see how uh, how this is moving. Then uh, Cibor tag for date status. Um, Mike, he's not here yet. I think he he replied that he would be joining. So maybe let's move that for later. Um, then we have a discussion. I don't know what order we want to take this on. Uh, Kasten has submitted a, a new OID draft. Um, and then the discussion that Jim has started on CDDL module design. And I want to take 10 minutes at the end to talk about ITF 108 and make sure that the scheduling works and maybe talk about the agenda items a little bit. So Yeah, let's talk about OID first because I think that will be quick. Okay, go ahead, Kasten. Um, so uh, th this draft has been stuck for, for almost, or even more than three years now, uh, because uh, my esteemed co-author um, put a lot of stuff in there that was was very innovative and, and novel and all that, but maybe uh, was going beyond what we typically do in a tag. A document and and uh, AS1 object identifiers are kind of very basic, so maybe we shouldn't try to attach too much stuff to them. So um, I I took the uh, document from three years ago and refocused it to to doing exactly that, defining a, a, a couple of tags for AS1 object identifiers. And um, I removed all, all the other things that are also interesting, but maybe should go into different uh, documents. With those tags, um, I kept one interesting feature, which is tag factoring. So you can put an, an OID tag on an array or a map, and then the OID tag applies to all elements of the array or to the key, all the keys of the map. Um, I think that that may be a useful abbreviation, but I removed all the more complicated uh, forms of using tags, tags, stacks, and, and all that. Um, and I think we need to be a little bit critical whether I didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater there, but I think that what's currently in the draft is a, is a pretty good set of functionality that, that will say, say, uh, solve 99% of the problems. Uh, on the keys or on the values for a map? On the keys. Yeah, th that's a good question, but really the keys. So the, the assumption is that we, we have things like uh, X520 uh, names and, and stuff and uh, just can, can uh, avoid putting a tag on, on every key in there uh, by putting the key on the map, uh, the, the, the tag on the map. Okay, I haven't had time to read it yet, but uh, this is a action point for the working group to take a look at the document. Yes. So I, I wanted to have on the, on the agenda today to uh, verify that, that the general direction 
is not going counter to what the working group wants. And I will submit an, a dash or seven uh, later so we have a proper uh, draft to actually look at as a working group. So, Karsten, just um, I guess I read this once a while ago, but um, I just looked at it again. So, just to, to confirm for me, we you've created a tag which lets us put an OID in ASN1 format in, not a way to encode an OID as an array of CBOR integers, right? Right. Okay. And when you say AS1 format, you mean basic encoding rules format? D, yes, I mean that. Sorry, excuse me to be for imprecise. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also uh, put in a little twist to the relative OID thing. Um, there are uh, these RFC 6256 SDNVs, and these are identical uh, in, in structure and, and semantics to, to relative OIDs. So I thought we could just reuse the tag for that one as well. So I expect to get some, some feedback back, um, on, on that. So th that saves us having to do a, a separate tag for SDNVs. I think it's six two five six. Okay. Uh, thank you, Carsten. So I, I take it that I will do the dash or seven, submit that today, and then we do the usual thing, look at this and, and yes. maybe look at this with a view to actually adopting it soon. Yes. Um have you had any contact with Len, uh, with Sean? No. Okay. Just to know. Okay. Yes, I think it sounds good, and uh, so we can move to the next item. So Mike has joined. I don't know if you want to take that before the CDDL discussion. It's less likely to take a lot of time. Let's do it that way. Yeah. I, I wake up this morning and I see there's been a bunch of discussion about time zones. Um, I'll, I'll back up and say I draft two to um, address the working call comments that came in. Um, one of which was a wording suggestion by Jim that I adopted. Most of the others were saying, be clear that there's no time zone. So I now say that there's no time zone and that eight seconds don't apply. And I see that Kirsten responded to your data about uh, Angela Merkel's date, so, which I thought was a good uh, I haven't read through the rest of it uh, because I'm just there. But something in the discussion that went after, I think we're ready to send this to the. There's something hidden in the discussion. Yeah, I think that the main requirement here is that, that we explicitly identify this as calendar dates as opposed to 24 hour periods that are anchored on a time scale. And I think that that's all that needs to be done. So what one or two sentences should should fix that. Um, I sent a slight update on what I'd like to see in the security sections. Um, I wasn't overly happy with the particular text you had. Okay. Um, I see that there's email from you in my inbox. So um, why don't I read those while we just email and then let's come back to this topic here in a few minutes after I've read the thread. That works.
Yes, that sounds like a good idea. Okay, let me read what came in last night. Great. So in the meantime, uh, we can to the CDL, CDDL module design discussion. I posted the first mail in the mail archive for this thread. Um, so Jim, do you want to maybe summarize what this was? Uh, basically, modules is one of those things that everybody wanted. So I started by trying to figure out some of the questions I think that need to be answered and sending them out for discussion. Um, anything that we want to focus on now? Um, um, or should we go through all of them and, and summarize what our opinions are? I think that the first thing that should be discussed is the question of global namespace versus not global namespace. What does not global namespace mean? ASN.1 doesn't have a global namespace. Each... Well, actually, it, it does. It's called OID. And the only thing it is used for is to identify a module. Yes. Um, so any symbol which is defined inside of a module has to be explicitly imported from an external module. Yes, I would expect that's what we are going to do as well. Okay, that was not at all clear to me from what you were saying. Um, since we you were talking... We still need a global namespace so we can identify uh, modules. Uh, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't expect that the the symbols that are used in a specific uh, CDDA specification are coupled very tightly to the global namespace. So this is what the, the module uh, uh, feature should, should actually do for us, uh, managing those namespaces and making sure a specification can, can use names defined in other specifications. Uh, without having to to uh, uh, provide the full name on on every use, and that's why my, my text has a, had a distinction between symbols, which are the names that are that we are using within a CDDL spec, and uh, various kinds of global or external names or references. Uh, uh, that there is also a difference between names and references, so a reference can be something that, that still needs to be resolved until you actually have the, the, the global uh, thing. Yeah, so... I did, I, I did not read that from your piece of mail. Okay, we need to uh, define that terminology. So if you look at SDF, uh, we, we have a global namespace in there too. Uh, but you you uh, essentially use the the curry construct in SDF uh, to to reach into that global namespace, uh, which, which is one way of doing that. This is not necessarily the one I would uh, suggest for CDDL, uh, but there needs to be a link between the the global names and the names that are actually used in a specification. I thought that with SDF you could have two different modules that actually define the same internal name. Yes, and I would and with the same namespace. The same with the names with the same namespace. Yeah, I'm not sure that would be very useful. 
but there's there's no way to actually stop people from defining names. I mean, we, we don't have an armed guard sitting behind every person. So uh, people will define names. Um, and uh, the, 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 the obvious problem here is that uh, we not only have different people writing different modules, we also have the same module going through rev revisions. Um, so we, we will have several definitions of the same name in, in some way. And we will need to be able to disambiguate which one we actually uh, mean. In SDF, is the module itself named? Yes, but that's not relevant. So the the um, the module doesn't really have a name, but it has a default namespace, uh, which looks like a URI, uh, into which the module actually exports names. So it's a little bit like a namespace declaration in C++. You just say, where, where do the things that are exported here go? Could you, could you make an example, Karsten? Really like a namespace declaration in either ASN.1 or uh, Python, maybe. Yeah, I must admit I'm rusty in both, so I'm not entirely sure what properties they have. Well, ASN.1, every module is named with a unique name. If you, yes. revise, if you, if you do a revision of a module, it gets a new name, which is painful. Yes, I think the, the young people are trying to do something similar, except they also have embraced semantic versioning. Uh, so the, the version is, is part of a name, uh, and they also have dates on these things and so on, and I, I need to understand how exactly all these uh, uh, parts play together in Yang. But Yang is definitely uh, something we should be looking at because they have just gone through the uh, process of fixing up uh, their their naming, uh, versioning, and and uh, publication process, and and all this stuff. Uh, so oh, we probably you're gonna make me learn Yang. Something. You're gonna make me learn Yang. No, I just say we should look <laughs> at the the way they do their module naming and so on. Yeah, it's not super elegant, I think, but it's okay. <laughs> it, 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 essentially, every Yang module has a, has a sed script that edits it so that it can have the right module names inside of it while you're developing it. It's a bit annoying. Um, I would rather not have to do that. Um, <laughs> and um, at least PyYang itself doesn't exactly always know how to pull in the like you can't specify the module the most recent version of this module as far as i've ever been able to see, see so you sometimes wind up building some tooling around the tooling so that you can get the right right thing with the right name and it just be yeah, nice the, the, not the, to do that there is an interesting spectrum here so you can build your system in such a way that that is it is uh, completely deterministic, in which case uh, the best module name is a cryptographic hash over the module's content. That works very well. Uh, but it also is very hard to work with. So in, in uh, uh, operating systems, we have package managers that actually do the work for us be before we can use naming schemes. Uh, like that, and that's probably the, the kind of software that, that you have been uh, talking about now. And the other end of the spectrum is to have a reference system. So we have an expression that says, give me the newest foo, and then we have a resolution process 
that actually uh, resolves that reference into a specific module. Well, gem uh, files and, and Python requirements do yeah. that really well. And I think they do it sufficiently well for, for our purposes. So that might be worth stealing. Yeah, so and we have running code. I, I would expect that, that uh, we can uh, do something like such a reference system. We, we still should think about this uh, a lot because it, it's easy to fall into the trap of applying your experience from managing pieces of software uh, to uh, managing specifications. And that, that is different and not all intuitions actually apply. So uh, Python has this, this great feature called from future import, which uh, nicely demonstrates that versioning is, is uh, sometimes weird. <laughs> well, okay, so it's a comment, just a last comment probably. Uh, uh, we are not talking about files here. I think specifications is a good thing. And, and I think Yang people think about as files mostly. So there is this date tag added to them. Sorry about calling it a date tag, but actually it is. So, um, so and that is uh, to disambiguate uh, revisions, um, but that's it. It is not used in Yang itself anymore. It's only used in the specification of the module on the specification text around the module effectively. And we need something that is not only for files. That is, I think, very important. I mean, we talk about software here as an ex counter example, and, and these typically also are uh, somehow tangible, more tangible CDDA specs probably are not always that. So that uh, is, I think, very important, especially uh, inside the um, CDDA um, notation. Hank, I don't understand why you think that CDL specifications don't more or less directly map to files. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, that's just what in the early days when creating CDDL, um, we uh, uh, there's an order to the rules. Uh, so, um, so uh, we always, I, at the start, I always thought about we, we concatenate two files, and of course the order is clear. But there are just uploaded blobs of data that reside in memory and never are a file. They still have to be ordered correctly. But now you don't have a file system. You only have two specifications, and they have to kind of uh, be self-descriptive in their own way. And that is the reason why we think this uh, the root rule has to be at the very beginning. If there are two root rules, there could there are two specifications that are relying on each other, and you concatenate them, and now you have a, a no file in there, so names, no namespace problem because they know each other, so to speak, or they're built with awareness of each other, but uh, uh, they still have to be in the correct order. Uh, and that is, I think, something that is also to the module design here. But maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think oh, no, the, no, that's the, definitely true. The, the shortcut of uh, using the first rule uh, to say this is what this uh, uh, specification ultimately defines, that worked reasonably well for the first five years. But I think with, with a module uh, system, we really don't need this any longer. Um, so I think that, that uh, uh, we, we will have ways for a specification to be explicit about what data types it actually exports. And we, we have a number of specifications that export more than one data type, uh, which uh, happened first in RFC and COSI, which, which has this weird uh, <laughs> rule at, at the top, which says uh, COSI has the following five relevant uh, exported uh, data types. Yeah, that's um, my fault. <laughs> 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 Definitely my fault. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we want to go beyond that. And then maybe the yeah. question of order uh, gets a little bit less important. I, I sent a message to the mailing list a couple of uh, uh, minutes ago that, that goes into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, 
so we cannot completely ignore order but th this kind of problem uh, that we we are having where we are building our specifications out of files and have to be careful uh, putting them into the right order i'm i'm not sure that we will have that once we have a module system yeah so so mitigating that via module system i think is exactly the point yes um so uh, but but still it has to take on that requirement and therefore make it work yeah so in 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 the end we are not going to tell our tool validate this instance against against that specification but validate this instance against the exported type foo out of that specification. Yeah, and I also uh, understand probably that there might be dependencies here uh, uh, that you need imports uh, yes. on the other side. Yeah, exactly. So I think explicit export and import interfaces are really the, the yes. important yeah. part. Exactly. And uh, Maybe the the way the these interfaces uh, interact with the the global namespaces um, is something we can import from SDF or at least can can steal some ideas from SDF. We don't have to structure it exactly like that. Um, but I think the important thing about uh, the way SDF uses these namespaces is. It uses URIs, but these URIs are not meant to be dereferenced. So you, you cannot expect to find something at a specific URI that, that is uh, either useful at all or, or complete or up to date. Um, so I think we are uh, digging ourselves into a big how will, if we build this around URIs that actually are meant to be dereferenced? In SDF, the URIs that are used are, are, are in the URL name space? Yes. So they are usually HTTPS uh, URIs, but uh, at the same time, they are not intended to be de de dereferenced. So Which is becoming a very common trope. Yes, it's uh, like the way that UIs are used in RDF and, and other uh, places. Um, this is bike shedding, but I don't like the word export the way you defined it. Um, but we can argue about that later. Yeah, I, I already agree to you uh, in, in one of my <laughs> so I know what you mean, and um, I'm uh, the, the word export is really a technical term that really should be called contribute. So a specification contributes to the global namespace, and uh, it, it does this in such a way that you are you don't run into random concrete walls that, that people have uh, uh, erected in, in, in uh, good intention, but not go knowing that the world was going to rotate under them. So what's the inverse to contribute? Steal. Steal. So <laughs> nah. Politician. <laughs> that was near the bone. <laughs> uh, so, so I, in my in my human readable annotations that I not to get confused myself, I put into uh, see the specification nowadays is actually literally depends. So uh, I depend on the contribution of some other thing. Otherwise, I will not function properly. Uh, it will function, though, mostly. That is a little bit uh, weird. So it's not really a dependency. Dependencies, I think, are things that do not run or do not work at all without yeah. something that's contributed. But the contribution is basically, maybe it's more like an augment. I don't know if we can call it augment. 
uh, but it's more like an overview. So you only add things. It has to be self-sufficient in the first place. Otherwise, it will not be uh, a valuable a valuable module. Um, uh, if it's if it's importing, sorry, if it's depending. Um, but uh, yeah. action dependency. So it's a little bit like the socket concept in CDDL, where you have something that anyone can contribute to. Yes. The, the specification doesn't really tell you which of these contributions are good or bad or should be used or should not be used. That That's something that needs to be done separate from the specification. Yeah, and then I should also contradict myself right now again because I see the specification parts that are right are, of course, not safe uh, uh, sufficient sometimes. Sometimes they are only purely contributing uh, CDL specifications. They are not a, a full spec by the, their own right, and I highlight that. So these are not uh, they are, these are not root CDLs. I call them mostly. So uh, as a specific kind of dependency to that, they need something to contribute to. Otherwise, they do not really work. Yeah, let's call those rootless specifications. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the prelude, the prelude essentially okay. is. The first uh, big rootless specification we did. Exactly. Um, that is that is a very good example. Uh, that's always there, and it's used by everything. It's a little bit of a, of a hybrid, therefore. But uh, yes, um, same thing like that. Uh, if you have a second level uh, prelude build uh, that can be consumed by other, it contributes to everything else in in, in the build. Uh, that should be a viable module. Yeah, so people should be able to to pick up those additional preludes, and uh, usually when when we do a tag definition, then we uh, put a couple of lines of CDDL into that tag definition, and that that's really something that should be selectable. So you you can say, uh, he, here's the the CDDL for the tag definition, and I can just import that uh, w without a lot of ceremony. It also allows us potentially to better select between the JSON prelude and the Seabor prelude. Mm, yeah, you know, you are more constrained if you are, uh, cons yeah, constrained if you, uh, if you do going with the JSON prelude, uh, simply some uh, types are not allowed in there. Uh, so you cannot just, uh, uh, use a contribution that is a uh, JSON prelude or something built on that and then plug it into, a, sorry, otherwise, the, the Seabor prelude and plug it into a, a, a CDL spec that is for JSON. It simply does not work. Yeah, I think it's important to think about how uh, composition works yeah. with these switches and uh, how, how do you actually use a module that has a switch uh, from another module that also has a switch and make sure the switches are thrown in, in synchrony. So that's where the features come in, which I think are really yeah. important to, to make module references work. Yeah, so all these three things, like the, the namespaces, uh, slash some uh, versioning, the, the, the uh, modularity here that we have uh, with contribution and its complement, and then the feature stuff is always uh, interconnected somehow. It, it all, the, all is related, closely related to each other. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's while they're independent topics uh, and they can be uh, defined independently, maybe even they strongly relate. So Jim, how do we, how do you plan to uh, um, um, address the items in your initial email? Um, do you want to steer the discussion a little bit, like like one by one, and uh, not not here, I mean, uh, in the list, I mean. Um, well, the problem is some of the some of them are, are, are rather interrelated. Um, but more or less, yeah, I think, but I think going through them one by one is is probably going to be relatively useful. Um, 
I know that Michael has, I know that Michael and Karsten both have comments about whether or not this should be part of the native language or not. Um, what are the trade-offs for making it? Karsten, Karsten is, is it possible for us to just define basically a prelude to the language? And not basically rewrite all of CDDL. Does that is that something that's potentially useful? So I, I would generalize this question: Is do, do we manage to get a clean layering between the module layer and and what we have now? And uh, I think that would be useful to have, uh, but I also don't think it's it's an absolute requirement to have it. So we should evaluate this as we go. Do you think the same thing is also true for identifying features? Yes, I think so. Sorry, what exactly do you mean with identifying features? Sorry, I'm you gonna uh, I'm gonna yeah. uh, stop the discussion. Uh, here it's a bit abrupt, but uh, Mike just told us that he needs to leave, and I would like oh. to get some update on that as well. And then maybe we can go back or uh, see how much time we have left. Sure. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Let's let's do that. Mike, go ahead. We only need about a minute. I've read through the threads. I can add a sentence. Um, Possibly even in the abstract, as well as the introduction, saying that this represents calendar dates and not a particular point in time. And Jim wrote some text to replace the text that I wrote about decision making for access control. And I'm fine using something based on Jim's text. So I will publish another draft today probably within a couple hours. And at that point, um, if the chairs concur, I think this can go to the IESG. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I think, no, I think calendar, uh, this, this in the beginning, this is the calendar day and, and the yeah, points in time, is everything we need. We don't have to be overly reversed there. And I think that's fine for IC then. Okay, and Jim's access control text, I can do something based on that. I think that's all I needed to say. Uh, Mike, what was uh, Jorgen comment or email? Is that, I think I missed that. The statement about this being a calendar date and not a time addresses what he was talking about. I think we already actually addressed it when we said that time zones and leap seconds are irrelevant, but we can be even more explicit. He was asking for something that this is not. Um, this is uh, for exactly the passport use case or the driver's license use case where it says I was born on March 22nd, 1960. It does not say, you know, at what time I was born or in what time zone. Okay. Yeah, it's like uh, a plan. You can submit an aversion and then especially people who had uh, comments can take a look at it and see if everything is addressed and then before sending to ASG, we we'll still need to do the uh, shepherding work. Um, so that might take a little bit. That's right, and will the shepherd be? Yeah, um, we haven't talked about it. <laughs> so me and Jim need to decide who takes this. Okay. Yeah. I mean, either of you or Karsten would be fine, but that's me what you say. If Karsten wants to volunteer, I'm sure that uh, that would be great. Well, I don't think I should. I, I'm suddenly going to, to watch this closely, but I'm not sure I should be the shepherd. 
the okay. casting. You, you're not a court chair. What are you doing with your all your time now? <laughs> Writing drafts. <laughs> one, I'm kidding. One a day. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Everybody. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Mike. Okay. And we can go back to the CDDL discussion. Maybe let's, you can see in the minutes what the discussion was. Um, okay, so. Just before you. So Hank, what I was thinking is that it might be useful for a module to identify what features it thinks it needs. Ah, as okay, well as it lies on the again. As as well as a module identifying what features it ha it provides. Yeah, that is a um, a um, subtlety added to the uh, things it contributes. So it a, a a module will contributes amongst other things dedicated features that are clearly highlighted, and that is fine. I think uh, that should be exposed. But then again, it is a feature annotation then. And I assume that is already, uh, if you go through the spec, which you have to do in any case, I assume, as you uh, process it, you will know all the features. So I'm not sure if the feature notation itself requires any additional frosting in, in the CDI specification to highlight that it provides that as contribution. Carsten? Yeah, I think the 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 the, the whole thing about features is uh, what can you actually do with it then. So in the um, CDL tool, I was going to put in a feature, excuse me, uh, for uh, being able to select uh, which features are enabled, which means we we assume they are present, uh, which features are disabled which means we assume they are not present. Um, and uh, then there are other features that, that are not not influenced by this command line interface. So they, they don't, um, they, they will lead to warnings or informational messages, but uh, um, they, they are not, not used for switching on or switching off uh, things. Um, but maybe we are overloading the feature mechanism too much. So, uh, I think that that has to be tried, and um, maybe we want a different mechanism for switching on and switching off things from the the mechanism that uh, says uh, you have to have feature X to use this part of the specification. So just to be clear, you're talking about features in terms of compiler slash language features, not features in terms of we have added this to this module. It becomes that worse. There, there are three levels. There, there are features in the language or the compiler. There, there are features in the specification. And there are features in an implementation. And we need to juggle all three. And it's most likely not possible to do that with one feature. Can you just give an example of each just so we're all on the same page? Yeah, so so um, uh, imagine that uh, we have uh, an update to the uh, reference resolution process. Then we probably want to write in our specification. Um, hi, I only can be compiled uh, by uh, uh, a CDDL implementation that has this feature. So that would be a language or compiler feature. Then there are <laughs> specification features, um, which means that um, a specification evolves and you, you want to reference or depend uh, on a specification that actually has an a, uh, a certain step in its evolution behind us as opposed to still in front of it. So that, that caters to the fact that not all systems will have exactly the same set of 
uh, revisions of, of a module available. And on the implementation side, uh, you may have features because, well, some implementations can do JSON and CBOR and some can only do JSON. So you, you have to know which of these uh, uh, features are available in an implementation. So the specification is fully evolved to support both features, but still you may want to select I my implementation only does one of them. Would you consider the JSON slash Zbor to be something that would be advertised as a specification feature? Well, the, the JSON slash Zbor thing can can appear on the specification feature level and it can appear on the implementation feature level. No, I understand so that. I wanted to make sure that you thought it also did appear on, on the uh, on the specification level. Okay. And th that's actually something that will happen a lot, that we will have a specification that only has a JSON uh, version or only a uh, CBO version initially, and then we add the other uh, one in as well. And uh, then you need to, to uh, handle both the fact that parts of the specification may not have been updated yet, and the fact that implementations uh, actually may provide only one of the two. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, example that binds most of these uh, topics together. I think it's very illustrative. Yeah, and so far, we, we at the language level, we managed to avoid features, except we have one very, very obvious feature. Uh, so we are extending the set of control operators. And the simple fact that a specification uses a particular control operator uh, means that it requires that feature uh, from the compiler. And we probably want to refine that a little bit. Uh, so for instance, we are able to, to say, uh, we have a specification here, and if you actually have a regex implementation of type X, then you can check those strings as well, but that, that's not, not necessary to, to use the specification. So we may actually want to have a slightly more refined uh, feature mechanism at, at the CDL level as well. That also seems to say, imply that you're tightly tying together the compiler and the validator. Good point. No, we shouldn't. So a compiler could start because could, could have a feature that a validator doesn't have. Yes. And, and note that the validator actually there are different kinds of uh, processing models. Uh, we don't have actually embraced all these processing models. So being able to perform a particular part of the processing model, so for instance, putting in default values, uh, that that will be one feature of of a CDDL uh, processor, and uh, some will have it and others won't have it. Okay, how should we proceed? What's the next step? This is a very interesting discussion. Um, but we should start having maybe a plan on how to move forward. Well, it should be no surprise that, that I really love defining terms because those terms allow us to, to be uh, specific about the, the concepts uh, we are using. 
So uh, it may be useful to just spend some some time defining those uh, uh, terms. So of course, we we are probably going to discard half of them at some point because they turn out not to be so useful. Um, so uh, once we have done that a little, uh, we might want to identify invariants. Um, so so properties of the solution that are going to stay or that, that are at least desirable um, so we understand what, what the constraints on the design space are. And then at some point, somebody has to, to just generate a lot of examples uh, for how, how this could be done in an actual uh, 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 new revision of the specification. And I'm going to have to throw away the response I started writing to you on your terminology document, because, uh, terminology email, because all my responses has, have now changed after this discussion. Yeah, we probably should have these discussions. The thing that that's important. Okay, so I I think I agree that the first thing to do is is to set up terminology. Um, people can start thinking about examples that they think would be useful to express so that we can figure out whether or not we're covering all the bases. So it'd be useful to collect a set of those. Francesca, if you want your 10 minutes, you better start now. Yes, that's going to be short. So yeah, it sounds like a good uh, conclusion. And then I guess we can continue at the next interim as well on these and other points on your email, Jim. Does that sound good? Or... Um, is our next interim inside of the uh, forbidden zone or not? Uh, I don't know when this forbidden zone, zone is, but it's the 15th of July. That's insane. Yeah, and it's already scheduled, so we, we are safe. It's already scheduled. Ah, yeah. ah. And it is in so, the no, submission no. for Bin Zone. No, no, it's for Bin Zone, zone sorry. It's week 30 <laughs> when we are not supposed to have any interims except for the ones that are already scheduled. Week 30. And that week is. 30, week 30 is the week before the IETF. And I was trying okay. to, to get some, some meetings there and. Uh, that's not not allowed. Um, but that's uh, that's outside of this, right? Yes. Because that would be week twenty nine that we have yeah. our interim. So that's good. <laughs> right. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. So uh, we, so yeah, we have a next interim, and I think we can discuss. We can continue this discussion. That was very very useful. Yeah. So what what will be the other? items um well if barry is around we can ask a status update um we'll see if we get any comments about the oi document and uh, hopefully it will have also have a new submission so yeah depends on what happens <laughs> in two weeks Do okay. you have any other topic that you would like to add to the interim? Uh, I'm juggling so many things at the moment. Uh, as you may know, I have two buffs uh, that, that I'm a proponent for at IG 108. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, no, for the ITF 108 scheduling, I just wanted to um, ask the working group because uh, it's been scheduled for Monday. Let me open the agenda. Uh, Monday session two. And I think that works for us. We don't have any collisions that we uh, didn't want to have. But if I just wanted to check that that's right, because tomorrow is the deadline for requesting a conflict or a change of schedule. That's what's. 
my conflicts between core and TLS. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then you should uh, probably ping your chairs in core and ask them to move <laughs> to 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 request to change that. No, I, what I need to do is ask them to put TLS on the conflict list. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a bit too late for that now, but maybe <laughs> can fix that. Um, and then the other thing is we will need to submit a draft agenda. Um, let's see. Which is, yeah, so that's going to be the same day as our interim, the 15th of July. So uh, we discussed this a little bit last interim. We were saying that we would continue this DDL discussion. Now it's approaching. So um, again, if you have more detail about what agenda items you would like to have, then um, let us know. So one thing that, that might come up um, I already mentioned that uh, th there is an interest in uh, getting a specification done for JSON path, and that specification would uh, probably be applicable for CBOR as well, at least in, in some form. Um, so uh, the, the first meeting on Monday uh, morning is going to, the, to be the dispatch working group, and that might actually have an idea on how to handle this standardization, either Add it to the ASDF buff, or, or handle it separately, or uh, maybe do this kind of work in CBO as well. Uh, I don't know. So, but this might come up. Sorry, Carsten, can you say that again? JSON. JSON path. Path. So th th there is something okay. called XPath, uh, which yes. can for for XML, and that's that's a monster. And uh, most people who want to do something with JSON or CBO need a similar query language. Um, and there's something called JSON pointer, uh, which which is nice. And, and uh, we, we already tried once to extend that for CBOR, but noticed that this is uh, not as easy as we thought. So we, we didn't complete that yet. And JSON path is somewhere between the simplicity of JSON pointer and, and the Turing equivalent complexity of XPath. And uh, we still have to find out where exactly that, that is. OK, interesting. Thank you, Karsten. And that was it for me for the ITF 108 scheduling. Um, any other business real quick in one minute? Are you planning to submit starting dates for new interims? Um, I, I I think we discussed that last as well, and uh, the um, we decided that if I don't remember yeah. wrong, it would be after August. Yeah. Right. No, I, my question vacation. was actually a, a a chair issue. We need to actually request those request that starting point. Yes. And should we have a discussion on on times? Should we or should we just keep the same times? Um, keep the times. Oh, please keep the same times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Reaction was quite quite enthusiastic to to keep the same times. Okay. Rough consensus, I would say. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can do that after. Um, after the ITF week. Um, so this would restart in September, not in August? Exactly, yes. Good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and on that, I think we are done. So talk to you all in two weeks. Thank you for today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.